All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, building an IP captive portal from scratch. Subtitled for fun and education, but not for profit. Basically, because there's not really any money in doing this, but uh, I found it to be a, a fun project when I had some quiet time during the summer, and um, uh, I learned a few things in the process, and I hope to share that information with you now. So, uh, just start with some uh, of the usual warnings and disclaimers. Um, with this presentation uh, being sandwiched kind of between two major InfoSec events, uh, the long con that happened a little over a week ago, and next week being the premiere of Ralph Breaks the Internet. You know, I, I figure <laughs> everyone's got secure, security on their mind. But I just wanted to let you know, this is primarily kind of a how-to presentation. The main focus of this is not security. I will mention a, a few things over the course of the presentation about security, but that's not the main focus of this presentation. So if you do plan to follow these um, notes to, to try and implement something for yourself, you may want to pay more attention to security than uh, what this presentation uh, focuses on. So what motivated me to do this is we had a problem at work. Um, we've got a policy that uh, we can't give out um, IP addresses to unknown devices that are plugged in on the network. But we have a lot of users who do plug in unknown devices on the network. Um, the policy is documented, but who reads documentation? So we get new grad students, even old grad students, even professors who've been there for years and should know better, plugging in unknown devices onto the network, and then they're surprised and or frustrated when they don't get network access. And then they come to see us and say, how come I don't have network access? So um, the goal with this project was um, essentially to try and make things more convenient and easier for the users. Um, and to help facilitate the compliance rules that we have at the university. So, um, yeah, the main goal is, is just to add some new functionality to make things easier. It wasn't, as I said, primarily a security-related thing that I was um, trying to implement here. So, I kind of thought we could uh, do a captive portal um, for unknown devices, and uh, that would hopefully solve the problem. What is a captive portal? Here's the first few sentences from the Wikipedia definition. Um, fairly basic stuff. You probably all know this already. If you've ever used Wi-Fi in a public location, you've probably seen captive portal pages. You basically get diverted after you connect to a little login page or some sort of page where you will provide some combination of authentication information, payment information, or just click to accept uh, uh, whatever their policies are. And once you do that, then it will give you access to the network. Um, and until you do that, you're basically, everything is just being diverted to this, this, um, this captive portal. Um, other features uh, of captive portals that were of interest to me are summarized in the last two sentences that I have there. One is the idea of whitelisting particular sites so that even before people have authenticated, they have access to certain resources, um, such as the web server where you're implementing the captive portal, or p possibly additional web servers where the policy information might be made available. Um, and then finally, typically this all hinges on the MAC address of the device. Whether a device is known or unknown just comes down to the MAC address. There are security implications there, of course, but I'll let you worry about that. So um, there's different ways you can implement a captive portal. Um, one of the more secure ways of doing it, if you can, would be um, making use of uh, managed network switches that support that functionality. and. Um, uh, the reason for that is uh, it's, it's a lot harder to circumvent because uh, typically what they do is they put you on a separate VLAN which is completely isolated and you can't get past that until you actually um, 
um, authenticate or whatever. Um, so if this works for you, that would be a good way to do it. Uh, just to quickly summarize what we're talking about when we talk about layer two is over here, the frame or data link layer. Um, that's where uh, switches work. Uh, but what I'm going to be talking about is actually doing it at the IP layer. Um, the reason for that is we had an additional problem is that we've got um, a heterogeneous network environment with a number of different types of switches including um, unmanaged workgroup switches in some of the labs and one of these switches might have a combination of known and unknown devices and they all are on one of these switches that are unmanaged. We also have switch ports that are on RV land, but it's not on switches we manage, so we have no control over the configuration of those switches. So turns out implementing it that way was not a possibility for us, so I decided to do it at the IP layer. And so here essentially are the main components. This is just kind of a generic <laughs> overview of, uh, of that. So this is nothing OS specific or software specific, it just to give you an idea of what the various stages are um, that are involved in this. So um, over on the left-hand side, you've got your unknown client that plugs into the network. And typically one of the first things it's gonna do is a DHCP request and that will be to your DHCP server. It will then provide that unknown client with an address. Because it's unknown, it's going to give it an address that is on a private um, uh, uh, network, like not a public facing network. And um, the other key piece of information that the DHCP server will give it is a default route, which will point to our captive portal host which is going to have some sort of network filtering implemented to essentially block access to the rest of the internet. Um, and the other thing that that filtering is going to do is it's going to divert uh, DNS requests and HTTP requests to uh, components that we control. Um, so then typically that client, once it's connected, it, one of the first things it's gonna do is a DNS lookup um, if it's being nice, it will use the DNS server that we've provided, which will be our own internal DNS server. But even if it's trying to override that and connect to some DNS server out on the internet, um, we're going to divert it to our DNS server. Uh, the reason for that is uh, primarily security uh, related because it turns out if Rob were here, he could tell you there's all kinds of weird shit you can do with DNS, including um, uh, uh, essentially tunning, tunneling through a DNS server to basically bypass your captive portal. Um, so then once that DNS request is satisfied, uh, typically your client is then going to do a web lookup, and so that's gonna get diverted. Um, those diversions, by the way, happen technically using something called DNAT, which is Destination Network Address Translation. And uh, so then it's going to talk to our web server, which is then going to serve it uh, some kind of uh, dynamic content, typically a login page of some sort. And then that login page, once the data is collected, uh, you're going to do some kind of authentication, and once you've determined that this client is okay, um, you will then uh, pass control over to some kind of management function, which will then let you uh, uh, list that MAC address, uh, insert it into the network filter, so that that um, device is now considered as known. And once that happens, wait for it, poof, your little block on uh, the rest of the internet disappears and uh, now that device can access using SNAT, which is the source network address translation, it can then access the rest of the internet. Um, another thing that I wanted to quickly mention about these two things here is that they may require 
some kind of elevated um, privilege, uh, unlike the backend uh, processing from the web server, which is going to be unprivileged. So again, this is a very generic look at the components. And this is essentially the same thing, just made a little more complicated now, that uh, is looking at the way I chose to implement it uh, using a Linux system um, and various open source components that are available on Linux. And so um, going through the numbers again, so for DHCP, I'm using the ISC DHCP server. For uh, DNS, I'm using ISC bind. Um, the filtering is done within the Linux kernel using uh, netfilter IP tables. And um, I'm using the Apache web server. The backend processing, I chose to just do a simple CGI um, script. The authentication, I chose something called PWAuth. And um, then the managing of the uh, MAC address information for NetFilter. I just use sudo and then a little helper script. So um, I'm going to go over these components in a little more detail in the order that I've shown them here. So the first thing with uh, DHCP, this is what the configuration would look like, or at least a, a rough skeleton of what it would look like with um, ISC DHCP. By the way, each of those components I was talking about, we could do like a separate daemon dash or a full presentation on each of them. I'm not going to do all of that tonight. This is just going to be a very quick overview of some of the directives that are particular to what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, yeah, Chris. Question. So you don't have control over the VLANs, you don't have control over the switches, you don't have control over the routers, mm -hmm. but you are allowed to run your own DHCP servers and firewalls. Yep. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on. Yeah. So our DHCP server um, basically is, is just going to implement a couple different pools. One for known devices over here um, with a directive here saying deny unknown clients. And it will serve a particular range of addresses for that. And it will point them to typically uh, a router that is supported on the network. Um, and then we'll have a separate pool over here, which is for our captive portal. It's going to allow unknown clients. It's going to serve from a different range of addresses. And for the router, it's going to point them to our captive portal host. You can also do something a little fancier, which is going to make Adam cringe even more than he already has. <laughs> is uh, for instance, if on that particular uh, VLAN that you don't have control over, um, you might want to have two completely separate uh, subnets implemented that kind of overlap each other. One of them being our private subnet that we're going to use for the captive portal, and another one being either a separate private network, or in our case, it's actually a public facing network. Um, and so, uh, so this is what your directives would look like in ISC DHCP to implement something like that. And it turns out there's actually, this is something I learned just through the Wikipedia page on uh, captive portals. There's an RFC standard called 7710, which is an option in DHCP, happens to be code 160. And uh, it will then accept a string argument, which is to specify to your DHCP clients that you have a captive portal that you want them to talk to. Nice little feature. So I chose to implement that in my DHCP server. Problem is, there's no client that I am aware of that today actually will implement the client side mm -hmm. of that. So. It's there <laughs> for possible future use, but right now most clients have their own proprietary ways of doing captive portal detection, and they don't expect the DHCP server to tell them that there's a captive portal. Anyway, so that's DHCP. Moving on to the second component, which is NetFilter. Um, there's a lot of diagrams out there on the internet that try to explain how NetFilter works. 
This is the only one I've found out there that is complete enough and accurate enough. <laughs> So um, the rows here basically show some of the main um, tables that are part of IP tables. And the columns um, give the names for the chains associated with those. And typically when you're doing filtering uh, using IP filter, um, or IP tables rather, uh, you're going to be working with the filter table and uh, either the forward input or output chain. Most of the stuff I'm doing um, for this particular project is using the NAT table, and I'm primarily using the pre-routing chain with a little bit of stuff done in the post-routing chain. Um, there's also something where I, ha I have to do a little bit of magic where I set something up in the pre-routing change to then be handled later, like in the forward or input chains. Uh, I'll get to that later. So I talked earlier about DNAT and SNAT. Um, most of you are familiar with the concept of NAT in general, right? You're familiar with little uh, home routers that will implement NAT. What we commonly refer to as NAT is actually technically called um, SNAT, which stands for Source Network Address Translation. So essentially what that's doing is it's, ad it's changing the address, the source address of packets that are going out to the net network. Um, for what I want to accomplish here, um, most of what I'm interested in doing is actually DNAT. So I'm changing the destination address on the packets to basically shunt them to our captive portal. Um, so it turns out with IP tables, these are essentially the uh, typical um, prototype commands you would use for implementing that. Um, so for DNAT, you would use the pre-routing chain, and you would then specify uh, one or more arguments to uh, <coughs> select what type of packets you're interested in in uh, uh, then uh, massaging. And then you would use the DNAT target and you would specify the destination address. Um, there's actually also a special form of DNAT um, called the redirect target, uh, where you don't specify an address. Essentially what it does is it redirects it to the host itself or more technically, it redirects it to the incoming address of the host itself. Um, so if you're doing it all on one box, you could use redirect instead of using uh, this longer form. But this one gives you more flexibility because you can, you can shunt it to a different host if you want to. Um, the redirect target also would let you um, specify other arguments, for instance, to redirect to a different port. Um, but in our case, we're not interested in doing that. Um, on the post-routing side, this is where you would implement the SNAT. So this is typically just before packets go out onto your outbound uh, Ethernet address, uh, you would uh, rewrite the source address. And with the SNAT target, you would specify an address that you're, uh, you're changing it to. Um, there's also a, kind of a special form of it uh, using the masquerade target where you don't specify the address. Uh, this you would use, um, for instance, if your uh, host had a dynamic source address for its outbound address. Uh, that way uh, you can't really hard code it, so you just use this and let the system figure it out. Um, turns out this is a little bit more efficient if uh, you do have a static address. So if you read the documentation for IP tables, they recommend using this unless you, you uh, have a dynamic address, in which case you use that. So um, putting those pieces together, this is what my uh, IP table script looks like. Uh, in real life, mine is a little more complicated because I'm doing a little bit more work, but this is the, the crux of it. Sorry, yeah. your previous comment about the performance? Yeah. The difference is 
uh, SNAT is for one-to-one -one NAT. Masquerade lets you do many-to-one yeah. masquerading. Okay. So yeah, nobody would ever, even, even if you have a static IP address, you still wouldn't use SNAT in most scenarios. Okay. Unless it was a single host. Yeah. Right. Okay. There are scenarios. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, essentially what we're doing in our pre-routing chain, um, we're uh, accepting any traffic that is destined for our, uh, our private network. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, this is the whitelisting I talked about earlier. If you have particular web servers that you want to allow access to even before um, the, uh, the client has been authenticated, um, you would uh, put in uh, rules like this basically to allow access to those particular destination addresses. Um, and then here is those uh, uh, DNAT rules that I was talking about on the previous slide. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is if we get any UDP traffic with a destination port of 53, that's DNS, we're going to shunt it to our captive portal. And then the next rule is we do the same thing for TCP, and we're capturing ports 53 for DNS, port 80 for HTTP, and just for completeness, I'm also doing port 453, which is HTTPS. Um, but there's a bit of a problem with that, which I'll get to later. Um, and so those also get shunted to our captive portal host. If the hosts that are implementing the DNS and the web are different, then you would split those up into separate rules. But in our case, we can do it all in one rule. Um, and then it would be tempting to then say that in our pre-routing chain, anything that makes it past this point, we want to just drop those packets. Um, the drop target, unfortunately, is not allowed in the pre-routing chain. You can only use that in your um, filter tables. Um, so in, in our case, what we want to do is drop those packets in the forward chain. But in the forward chain, how are we going to know which packets we have to drop? So the way we get around that is once we reach this point in the pre-routing chain, any packets with the source address of our private network we mark them with a particular code, and then in the forward chain, any packet that has that mark, we can just drop it. And then finally here in the post-routing chain, this is that masquerade target. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the mark, is, is 86 an arbitrary number? Or is it, it is, it's completely arbitrary. Okay. Actually, in um, one of the tutorials I was uh, following online, um, they used 99 as the code, and I figured if you're marking a packet for deletion, it would make sense to 86 it, so that's why I chose that instead. So with all this talk of the 86 and 99, you might be thinking of these two if you're of a certain age, or if you're a millennial, you'll be thinking those two. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> So the next component uh, is uh, the NAMD uh, configuration for our ISC bind. And um, as I mentioned, uh, you want to capture DNS requests, whether or not they were destined to your DNS server, um, because you don't want people to be uh, uh, tunneling through DNS. So I took the easy route in just implementing uh, straight DNS. I didn't do any custom configuration there. If you're really concerned about security, you would want to do a little bit more than what I did, though, because uh, it turns out even if you're capturing that DNS traffic, um, but then doing forward lookups to other DNS hosts, there's still a way, a sneaky way, to do tunneling uh, just based on doing lookups to particular domains. Um, once again, if Rob were here tonight, he could tell you all the, the, the weird shit you can do with DNS. But uh, um, I figured for our purposes, uh, this was good enough. If anyone was that desperate to tunnel through, rather than just authenticate with credentials they already have, they're welcome to it. <laughs> But if you were concerned about security, if this were, for instance, a paywall that you had built, 
um, you would want to do something a little bit more sophisticated in your DNS server. Um, for instance, not allowing uh, lookups uh, from these unknown clients to uh, external domains. You would instead give some fake results back to the captive clients, uh, similar to what some ad blockers like Pihole does. I had talked about Pihole in a presentation uh, a year or two ago. Um, so you would do something like that. Um, but of course, if you're giving fake DNS back to your client, you'll want to make sure that you set the time to live on those to zero so that they don't stay stuck in a, in a cache somewhere and um, mess with future lookups once the, the client is authenticated. So the web server, I chose Apache. Uh, one of the reasons I did is because I'm familiar with Apache. The other reason is it has this nice virtual host feature. And um, so I was able to set up just a virtual host using the uh, address of our target uh, on that private network for the, the captive portal. And uh, so basically any traffic that comes in on that address um, essentially, what I want to do in here is um, uh, assist clients that do captive portal detection um, to basically uh, point them to the right uh, web pages on my server. And so uh, this is mostly just following recipes I found on the internet from various um, sources that I cite over here. Uh, so here's what you would do for iOS and macOS devices. Essentially what they do is they set a user agent string called Captive Network Support, followed by some other stuff which we don't really care about. If it starts with the string Captive Network Support and it's um, specifying a host address other than our Captive Portal, then we know that this is its Captive Portal detection and so we point them to our landing page that we want for the captive portal. Uh, here's how you would accomplish the same thing for other clients. Um, Android devices and the Chrome browser, uh, they will essentially look for a page on a particular site called Generate 402, or sorry, 204. Um, and it's essentially a page that if it hits that actual web server it's trying to reach will generate a 204 code, which is a, a no content code. Um, not really used by much out there, um, so we figured this would be a good way for them to detect if they're actually getting through to their actual page. In our case, they're getting a redirect using a 302 code and they're getting our landing page. Um, so they will then know, okay, I've hit a captive portal. Um, Windows 7 and 8 uh, did a lookup for something called NCSI, which was an acronym for network. I can't remember. Anyone remember what it is? Anyway, <laughs> that, they looked for a file called NCSI.txt and they were expecting a specific text string in there. In our case, they're going to get our landing page instead, so they'll know that they don't have direct access to the internet. Windows 10 does a similar thing, except they've changed the, the uh, URL that they're looking for and the, the name of the file. So we just do a similar thing there. Um, Firefox also, uh, with more recent versions, does uh, a similar type of lookup. They look for a file called success.txt. So again, we just redirect them to our uh, landing page. And if we've missed anything else, uh, we'll just generate a 404 error and then point them to the same page. So hopefully, regardless of what the client is looking up on their web browser, um, they will wind up on our captive portal page. <coughs> um, that page will then either directly do the backend processing or will contain a link. Um, in our case, we actually wanted to provide the users with two options. One was to register their device for permanent access to the network, um, or if it was a device that they weren't interested in registering for permanent access, then we gave them a login page uh, for temporary access. So our landing page just gave them two links uh, with the two options. 
And then that also let us go from HTTP to links that provided HTTPS so that when they're doing their login, they're doing it over a secure link. Um, so uh, essentially what the processing is uh, for the authentication part is um, you would uh, uh, check to see if any input is provided in your script. Um, if there isn't, or if there's any errors in the input, uh, you want to send them a form to allow them to do the login. Uh, if all the input is okay, you want to authenticate them. And then if they pass the authentication, you want to register the MAC address. Um, once they're uh, successfully registered, um, you want to give them a result page that uh, says that. And on that page, it would be a good idea to provide a link to allow them to deregister their device. In other words, to log out. Um, but uh, you can also count on the fact that most users are not going to actually use that link to uh, log out on their own. Um, so you might want to have some sort of way of doing forced deregistration. Um, the way I chose to implement it at work was uh, actually a cron job that at the stroke of midnight turns every uh, client into a pumpkin. Um, but you might want to do something different depending on what policy you want to implement for that. Uh, you could use uh, app jobs, for instance, that would uh, piece by piece, like once, once a client is uh, registered, you would set an app job up to then deregister them after a few hours or whatever time period you're allowing them. There's um, uh, quite a few people who are using this for their children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do your chores. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, one of the tutorials I was following also suggested uh, saving state information so that if your um, if your captive portal host has to reboot um, any of these uh, clients that have been registered, you will then uh, re-register those MAC addresses. Um, in my case, I figured that's not really a big deal uh, if they have to re-authenticate because a server rebooted, which is a very rare event in our case. Um, uh, so I didn't bother implementing any of that state saving. So um, another way of basically deregistering everything is it happens automatically when, when uh, the portal reboots. And that's the case with this little Raspberry Pi implementation as well. So as soon as I shut it down tonight, it will forget all your MAC addresses. Um, so I talked about the web form that you would use for login. It's fairly standard stuff for the most part. Um, just a few things I wanted to point out. Because we're asking for a password, we want to make sure that we're using a post and that our target will be um, using a secure link, so HTTPS. I didn't bother with that on this implementation on the Raspberry Pi because I didn't want to deal with certs and all that. And since we just had like a dummy account anyway, it didn't matter. Um, but yeah, in real life, you would want to make sure that you've got security implemented properly there. Um, I highlighted in red just this one keyword that I discovered recently. It turns out this is uh, one of many uh, new keywords that are implemented in HTML5 um, for, uh, for doing form input. Um, and it's a neat little feature that will put the keyboard focus automatically into that field. Um, the way I used to do that is with a little bit of JavaScript, but this is way cleaner <laughs> than doing it with JavaScript. So I, I thought that was kind of a neat little feature. Um, moving on now to the backend processing. Uh, if you recall, I showed you on the diagram that there were a couple things that require elevated privilege. So they're not done right in the, the backend script from the web server. Uh, they're done separately. So one of those was the authentication. Um, I picked uh, something called PWAuth, which is um, freely available software. And uh, it turned out to be a very simple plugin solution. It came with its own PAM.D configuration that looked like this, that essentially just goes through the 
standard system authentication. And for my purposes, that was perfect because I figured any user that's going to authenticate their device should have an account already on our uh, network login servers. And so I didn't even have to tweak the PAM configuration. It was just essentially the same uh, login that's already implemented on that host uh, works for this. Uh, PWAuth is simplicity itself. It uh, essentially uh, reads two lines from standard in, the first one containing the user ID, the second one containing the password. It then does authentication through PAM and whatever backends you've got configured into PAM. Um, and uh, it then returns an exit code. And that exit code will indicate the success or failure of uh, the authentication. And you then use that to carry on from there. Um, the other thing about PWAuth is it's set up as a set UID root script. That basically gives it full access to uh, PAM, including access to shadow files and things like that. Um, and on the systems that I implemented it on, uh, it's restricted, actually, um, I said the web user, but it's actually the web group. Um, and so it's not generally ex uh, executable by any user on that system. It's, it's meant essentially as a backend for the web. Um, yeah, so. And then the uh, last little bit of processing that needs to happen was for managing the MAC addresses in NetFilter. That also requires root privilege to uh, basically use the IP tables commands. And so um, I could have used a technique similar to PWAuth by just writing it as a binary and uh, making it set UID. But in my case, I just wanted to do this as a simple shell script. And of course, you can't really do set UID shell scripts securely. So I chose to instead um, uh, run the script through sudo. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering how that would be done, actually, here's a slide I pulled out of my sudo presentation from back in 2011. That's why the look is different. And this essentially showed how you might um, set up a sudo script uh, that you could run through your web server. Um, so you're in an environment where, of course, you can't prompt for a password. So what we want to do is allow the web user to run that particular script, nothing else, uh, without any password. Um, and you may also need to set some flags saying that you don't require a TTY if that happened to be set already as a default flag. Um, yeah, so this is something I'd already demonstrated years ago in an RTFM presentation, and I've properly cited this so that I can't be accused of plagiarism. <laughs> Turns out you can actually be accused of plagiarizing your own work. So yeah, you're supposed to cite your own work. <laughs> Mm. It's so, a it's a serious problem in the mathematics world mm. of people recycling their mathematics to, okay. uh, to get multiple publications from the same things. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, a, it's serious business. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, uh, yeah. we people don't laugh at things like that because <laughs> the mathematics, you know, no humor at all. <laughs> so, normally at this stage, I would be done. Um, but I'm a glutton for punishment, so on my systems, I implement something called SE Linux. <laughs> and so I'm not quite done yet, because it turns out SE Linux ran into conniptions when I would try to run this. What? You're running sudo through a web server? <laughs> what? You're running SEID binaries through a web server, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, basically all of that backend processing, which is normally very privileged, it, uh, it didn't like the fact that I was in a SE Linux context that was still essentially uh, uh, meant for CGI scripts, which are not privileged. So it turns out um, the way around that is you temporarily turn off enforcing on your system. Then you do all your normal processing and let your audit logs collect a bunch of data. And then you process those audit logs through something called audit to allow to 
create a custom module and then you install that module into SE Linux and, uh, and then you can turn on enforcing again and you're done. Except you're not quite done because it turns out the uh, audit logs were not quite complete even after all this because it turns out there are some events that if they were normally logged would be just way too frequent and would create problems with your logs growing way too quickly. So there is a whole class of uh, SE Linux events that by default are not being logged. And so what you have to do at some point before you do all of this stuff is you do this to basically tell it to disable um, those rules that would suppress the logging of certain events. In other words, log everything, then you can collect your data, and then, of course, once you're done with all of that, you want to turn off that feature to make sure you're not filling your logs really quickly. Um, so at that point, you should be done. And I thought I was until a few weeks later, I was getting more SE Linux errors that were blocking this thing from working. And it turns out there was also a particular Boolean I needed to set. The reason I didn't realize that at first is, well, first of all, the documentation for SE Linux is pretty bad. <laughs> but the other reason, of course, is as I was testing all of this, I was initially doing some of this processing as root at the command line and all the modules I needed were being automatically loaded. But once I had rebooted this system and I didn't have the modules I needed, those were being loaded as a side effect of my backend script run through the web server. And so SE Linux was not happy about that. So then finally I discovered this is what was missing and I added it in. Um, and then I finally had a complete set of SE Linux rules to get this to work. Um, that module here um, that I had set up, just to let you know, this is what in the, uh, the type enforcement file, which is the text readable version of the file, this is just the allow rules. There were, what, 24 of them. Uh, the total file was like 80 some lines long because in addition to the allow rules, there were the type definitions and there were some comments and a few blank lines. But uh, yeah, the, the crux of it is this, and I don't expect you to memorize this or learn this. No one would, but essentially you do those commands that I had specified on the previous slide in the right order, and this should eventually all work. So. Um, I had subtitled the presentation uh, for fun and education, but not for profit. Uh, did I have fun doing this? Yeah, there was some parts that were a little frustrating, but for the most part, it was kind of an enjoyable, fun little hacking project to do when I had some spare time. Uh, what did I learn in the process? Uh, well, I learned a lot more about uh, Linux NetFilter and IP tables, including how DNAT works. I'd never worked with that before and using the pre-routing chain. Um, I learned some weird stuff uh, in ISC DHCP, uh, including that captive portal RFC and uh, all of that. I had no idea that existed. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I was already familiar with Apache's virtual host stuff, but I'd never really worked with it with IP addresses as opposed to just host names. And so that was uh, something new. And the main thing I learned um, that uh, was part of the Apache configuration was how captive portal detection works in different systems and how I could set up all the various redirect rules in Apache to do that. Um, I learned some cool HTML5 extensions for form input. I only showed you one of them, but uh, the link on that page uh, actually uh, would show you some other. There's all kinds of cool features uh, in there. Um, and I learned way more than I ever wanted to know about SE Linux. Uh, what is still left to do? Well, if uh, I wanted to, I could do something sane about HTTPS. Right now, I've got the redirect set up there, but 
if any clients try <coughs> HTTPS requests, they're going to the wrong web server, they're not getting the cert they're expecting, and so they're just not going to connect. And as the web becomes increasingly um, HTTPS by default, um, that may end up being a problem. Right now, most of the captive portal detection that clients do, do straight HTTP requests, so that should continue to work. However, um, I did come across some clients that didn't really work correctly in all cases, so I need to do a little bit more uh, researching on how various clients do that and what I can do better uh, in terms of web redirects uh, to support those clients. Um, as I said when I was talking about the DNS, if I really was more uh, concerned about security, I would want to do some better DNS handling than what I'm doing right now. Uh, right now it's a little bit of a gaping security hole if someone like Rob were to come onto the network and want to tunnel through uh, using D and DNS. Um, and of course in the name of security, um, I should do a, uh, some security auditing and hardening of all of this stuff to make sure that I don't have any other uh, backends that are exploitable. And that is my presentation. Any questions? Yes? This was done because you had time to kill, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I was curious as to how it worked, and I wanted to learn about it. And uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was fun and educational. Not very profitable. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, there's six ways you can just like do a drop in. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to learn about it. Yeah. Sense. yeah, the, the drop-in solutions didn't do exactly what I wanted them to do, though, because I, unless I, I, there are some out there that would let you really configure the web backend more than what I'm aware of. What were you thinking? You were thinking against PAN. Yeah. So there was that part, and there was also the fact that I wanted to give the clients the option of registering their device or just doing a temporary login, like just authenticating for, got, for access just for the day. We've got, could you, uh, sorry, could you have authenticated against LDAP instead? Uh, not right now. Oh, your local authentication. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there would be any commercial product that did that. Not really, but. Mm -hmm. As PAM? Yeah, that would be kind of a specific requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you were running LDAP, then pretty much everything would support that. Okay. But yeah, we've got uh, HP ClearPass at work, and it's got super customizable uh, custom, uh, captive portal okay. things. You can do all sorts of logic handling on, on how it enforces policies and blah, blah, blah. OK. Mm -hmm. yeah, captive portal being built into PFSense is good enough for 9.5% of use cases. Mm -hmm. This would be the other 0.5 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Not having control of the network is another thing most commercial products wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The tools for. Yeah. The other well. thing is I was kind of retrofitting this onto an existing infrastructure where we had ISC DHCP already. So I was looking at what can I tweak to the DHCP to implement this and you know just point them to a host that is already running a web server where I just you know so it was mostly grafted onto existing infrastructure yeah yeah any other questions all right thank you thanks